Today's meeting is being recorded. Um, welcome to everyone. Uh, we also have live captioning and ASL interpreters. Uh, if you need uh, live captioning, please click on the closed caption button in the Zoom menu bar at the bottom of the screen and enable captions. For those who need ASL interpreters, we recommend that you pin the interpreters, Helen and Kath Catherine. And again, thank you both for joining in the Zoom meeting so that they will remain on your main screen. For the duration of the session today, participants will be muted. If you have a question or questions for either of our presenters, please submit them using the chat feature. Also, feel free to indicate to which uh, presenter the uh, to whom your question should be directed, and we'll be happy to uh, s to speak that question to the presenter. Um, I will now introduce Dr. Sarah Timken, the Associate Director for Clinical Research within the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, to start us off with our welcome, Dr. Timken. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitaker, for that introduction. I'm um, Sarah Temkin, and on behalf of the Office of Research on Women's Health, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Women's Health Lecture Series event entitled Gender-Based Violence Prevention and Intervention Programs, Dissemination of Tools and Resources to Support Survivors. In 2008, the United Nations called on countries across the world to develop and implement a national um, action plan focused on violence against women and girls with an emphasis on the lens of social determinants for health and the subordinate status of women and girls in many societies. Last month, the Biden administration released the first ever national gender strategy that identified preventing and responding to gender-based violence as a strategic priority. Gender-based violence is both a human rights violation and a critically important public health problem. One in three women in the United States have experienced violence from an intimate partner in their lifetime. The World Bank estimates that about nine and a half million disability adjusted life years are lost annually due to gender-based violence. Gender-based violence takes on many forms, including physical, uh, sexual, or psychological harm, and is associated with serious, short, and long-term consequences with physical injuries, risk of subsequent victimization, and vulnerability to infections such as HIV. Women and girls of all ages, racial and ethnic backgrounds, income, and education levels, and ability statuses are affected by gender-based violence. In the United States, women facing economic disadvantage, racial and ethnic minority women, and immigrant women are disproportionately impacted by gender-based violence and its physical and mental health outcomes. To appropriately respond to the health needs of these groups of women and expanded community dialogue about social and cultural barriers to help seeking and to build clinical practice capacity to identify gender-based violence and implement specific interventions, reduce community stigma, and mobilize action on addressing structural inequities. In recognition of broader socioeconomic and cultural contexts that increase women and girls' vulnerability, researchers and advocates encourage describing gender-based violence using ecological models. Understanding the magnitude and impacts of gender-based violence and the risk factors operating at different levels, including individual relationship and societal, it is essential to, identi to, early, to identify early and uh, pay respectful attention to treatment of the physical, mental, and reproductive health care needs of survivors. Today's presentations from Dr. Nancy Glass and Anjanette Belcourt Center on efforts to optimize the identification of and response to survivors of gender-based violence in clinical and community settings. Dr. Belcourt's presentation will discuss specific efforts in indigenous communities, and Dr. Glass will describe key findings from her youth 3 supported project on an evidence-based safety decision and planning tool, My Plan app, that can be used to develop a safety plan and connect to local resources. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Temkin, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janine Austin Clayton, the Associate Director for Research on Women's Health here at NIH and the Director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. As part of NIH efforts to advance rigorous research relevant to the health of women, ORWH funds interdisciplinary research focused on the complex issues affecting the health of women through the understudied, underreported and underrepresented populations program, or U3. We are proud that our U3 administrative supplement program has funded 
projects related to violence and trauma in U3 populations of women. Violence and trauma are social determinants of health and they interact with all other determinants. And ORWH is pleased to be part of creating opportunities to discuss the call to action around gender-based violence and the dissemination of effective, culturally relevant responses and interventions to gender-based violence. Now, Dr. Mia Whitaker will give a brief overview of the U3 program before our guest speakers are introduced. Dr. Whitaker? Thank you, Dr. Clayton. Again, welcome today to today's event. Today's event is brought to you by ORWH's Understudied, Underrepresented, and Underreported Program. The purpose of the research on the health of women of understudied, underrepresented, and underreported populations administrative supplement program is to stimulate, promote, and accelerate state-of-the-art and cutting-edge research to address the complex issues affecting the health of women across the life course. The program encourages and funds research focused on the effect of sex and gender influences at the intersection of social determinants of health. Investigators and investigative teams are exploring women's health and health disparities related topics, and they, those investigators and investigative teams are encouraged to continue to imply. I now turn to, to our colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Barr, who will introduce our panelists. Dr. Barr. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Uh, Dr. Nancy Glass is the Independence Chair in Nursing Education and the Associate Director for the Center for Global Health at the Johns Hopkins University. She conducts multidisciplinary studies in partnership across diverse global settings, including in conflict and post-conflict humanitarian locations. Overall, Dr. Glass's program of research focuses on implementation and evaluation of violence prevention and response interventions, such as economic empowerment and safety planning to improve the health, economic stability, and well being of survivors of gender based violence and their families. We are also joined today by Dr. Anjanette Belcourt who is a clinical psychologist and a Native American professor at the University of Montana. She is also a collaborator of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Dr. Belcour was born to and for the Amscopi Pikuni, Blackfeet, Chippewa, Mandan, and Hidatsa nations. She is active in scholarship focused on mental and physical health within indigenous cultures and seeks to advance narrative approaches to healing and knowledge sharing. Her scholarship also focuses on the intersection of trauma, culture, resiliency, risk, ethics, land, and hope. Dr. Belcour is passionate about advocating for marginalized indigenous communities, including survivors and families who have lost members to domestic violence. She has three children and loves the homelands of her peoples. We will now transition into the panelists' presentations, after which Dr. Whitaker and I will moderate the Q&A session, and Dr. Nikea Maciosi will close the meeting. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to speak about uh, American Indian and Alaska Native survivors, as well as the you know, state of uh, public health science with regard to indigenous prevention and intervention. So I'm um, very honored to be here today. Um, introduce myself briefly. Oki Nistu Nadanako Amanisiaki. And so um, my name is Annie Belcourt or Otter Woman. And it's uh, it's really an honor to be here um, talking to you from Montana. <laughs> and this is also the, the homelands of the Salish and Kootenai uh, peoples, as well as many, um, many other Native people who have um, called this place home, as well as uh, part of their, their territories for, for gathering historically, as well as today, and, and how uh, many of us live here um, in, in this area of the world. So I want to talk today about a couple of different um, efforts that I've been engaged with, and, and I'm speaking to you on, with a couple of different hats today. I was speaking as both a scientist in terms of the social science around um, violence research and trauma and how it impacts communities, as well as a scholar who's um, worked in advocacy and education to help promote and improve our knowledge about uh, 
American Indian communities generally, but then specifically to this topic around um, inequalities and violence exposure and the unequal distribution of this burden to Indigenous communities in particular. So that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, so I entitled this talk Native Women Rising, and it's about survivorship, scholarship, and science. And so one of the things that's often asked to me is, is why does culture matter when I do presentations? Not necessarily here, <laughs> but in the world. And so it could also be known as culture and health, why it matters with regard to the topics, topics that we'll be discussing today. Uh, next slide, please. So these two photos are photos of uh, two of my ancestors. Um, so I have, uh, uh, you know, ties here in this landscape, you know, quite, quite far reaching back. Um, this is my great grandmother, Katie, and then her mother and Sima. And they were both um, traditional healers for the Blackfeet community. And so, you know, I view my role and I view the role of many Native scholars as, as a continuation of that resiliency. And I actually wrote my dissertation on resiliency because of the ways that I have seen um, Native communities cope with trauma and violence in resilient and strength-based ways. So our objective today will be to review violence prevalence very briefly in indigenous communities. So it won't be comprehensive in any, any sort of way, but a brief overview of the problem. Uh, talk briefly about tribal sovereignty, how that intersects with science, ethics, and prevention. And then to talk about narrative exposure therapy as an example of an intervention that's been used within tribal communities. And then finally, we'll end with talking about some of the applied public health efforts that we have uh, begun to initiate around prevention and intervention that are engaging communities in developing um, strength-based approaches to prevention. Um, part of that is action-oriented towards film, scholarship, things like podcasts, and empowerment development um, activities. So we'll talk about all those things today. Next slide, please. So this is a map just to orient those of you who may not be as familiar with Montana. Um, Montana and Wyoming are actually both part of what's called the Indian Health Service catchment area of the Billings area. So this map just kind of shows you geographically where we're located. And unlike like national statistics, most natives in Montana continue to live on the reservation communities. Uh, there, as we know nationally, that's not the case. Most native people live within urban areas and are very understudied. So we definitely need a lot more research that's targeted towards understanding urban issues. However, I show this map um, to also help to indicate the social determinants of health that really impact Indigenous communities here in Montana. So when we look at poverty and how different indications of poverty um, fall within Montana, we see that they are very much concentrated upon our reservation communities. Uh, the Roosevelt County, which is home to the Fort Peck Reservation, Glacier, which is where I grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation, and Bighorn, which is home to both the Crow and Northern Cheyenne, have the highest um, indices of different, several different um, poverty indicators. Next slide, please. So this table is a little bit of an older table, but it is consistently demonstrating a difference between tribal communities here in Montana and uh, other communities here in the state. So I bring this as an example to show, you know, some of the disparities we see in some of the social determining factors of health. We see, you know, if you look at each of the reservations in our state and the Little Shell are just recently recognized as a federally recognized tribe. Uh, so we don't have as much data and they don't have a land base here in Montana. Um, but for the ones that have the land base and have, um, have reported some of these um, statistics, you know, the bottom row is the state of Montana as a whole. And if you compare each of the reservations as well as the overall rates, we see a very significant difference in terms of economic resources and access to those factors. Next slide, please. And that translates, unfortunately, to issues with regard to violence in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. So one of the things that um, was reflected in our opening statements was that we see disparities based on gender. And these, unfortunately, translate to American Indian communities quite clearly. Uh, more than four in five 
American Indians in general experience violence across their lifetime. And men and women have victimization rates that are similar. However, when you start to look at differences in gender, we see very high levels of sexual violence um, for American Indian women and um, also stalking. So we see very clear differentials in terms of how people are, are experiencing these forms of violence. And this includes domestic violence. Um, you know, and one of the things I wrote an article for Indian Country Today talking a little bit about this is that we also very much need to know more about how the um, pandemic has impacted indigenous communities. Next slide, please. The service needs um, are in fact, and this is again prior to the pandemic, very restricted for American Indian and Alaska Native women. Uh, we see that very often people require medical or legal help when they're confronted with domestic violence or assault, assaultive forms of injury. However, um, when we think about two in five women reporting being physically injured in an assault, the services um, are frequently not available. More than a third, in fact, were unable to receive necessary services following um, an experience of violence. So we see a lot of also under-reporting of domestic and sexual violence cases uh, for many reasons, one being um, jurisdictional. So I talked about sovereignty, American Indian communities. It's important to remember we have sovereignty within the United States and, and oftentimes will interact in a government to government way with the federal government. Um, there's many factors that have shaped disparities with regard to prosecution of cases with regard to American Indian um, women, and as well as um, jurisdictional issues that have inhibited some of these factors. So we see a lot of exposure is the bottom line. And then there's a, a lot more that needs to be done, um, both in terms of our clinical medical and psychological care of folks, but also in terms of um, how we serve people in the legal um, services that we have available across the nation. Uh, next slide, please. When we think about trauma, we think about a couple of different domains, and these are just a few examples. This is not comprehensive, but if you look at incarceration, uh, here in Montana, American Indians make up about 7% roughly of the population, yet we make up about 17% of the, uh, of the uh, uh, incarcerated adults in, in the state. This is from 2014. And so 64% uh, are um, Caucasian and 77% uh, of male, sorry, male and female, and, uh, but 35% but of women who are incarcerated are, are Native American. Um, so, so these differentials really do translate to um, capturing some of the patterns of violence exposure that we see. Uh, we see violent rates that are, um, are much higher than other um, communities, homicide being one, and, and a lot of attention has been driven towards uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women. And thinking about that, I myself lost a sister to murder. And so I'm not um, atypical in that, unfortunately. A lot of families, um, if not the bulk of families, have been, have been impacted by um, either having a, a loved one missing or having been murdered in our communities. So it's a very big problem for many of our communities. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that I have um, tried to work on is to think about how to increase access to scientifically sort of supported interventions for um, American Indian communities. And one of the things that we have piloted both here in Montana and that has been piloted in Washington state is um, looking at narrative exposure therapy. So I have colleagues at the University of Washington who are doing some of this trial work um, as we speak. So narrative exposure therapy is an exposure and um, response prevention therapy. So basically it is founded on you know, very, very solid cognitive and behavioral therapies that have very um, rigorous empirical support. We know they work. And we know that there are ways that we can um, treat effectively things like PTSD in particular. So narrative exposure therapy is a therapy that's based on those same principles of cognitive behavioral exposure and um, also includes some testimonial therapy. And they've been developed internationally in, um, 
in uh, actually in, in Africa, where our doctor glasses, and, and other um, communities in Europe as well. And it, it helps to incorporate elements of storytelling and natural elements in terms of that storytelling process. So clients basically tell their story their life story, and they create a lifeline that incorporates symbols of both positive events that are represented by a flower and negative events, which are um, symbolized as a rock or a stone. And, and then it's a short intervention. It can be six to 10 sessions. And it's basically uh, the first session is the laying of the lifeline. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the subsequent sessions are, are based on processing some of those um, traumatic experiences as well as positive experiences. So it's been find to be, found to be effective within diverse populations as well as um, within populations that have very low resources and, and don't, have, don't have resources to clinicians who may have um, specialized advanced education. So it can be used by lay uh, folks to actually intervene. So people who are natural helpers within their community. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, the course of, of the, um, the key kind of contextual aspects of the therapy is that you are working like most other therapies like cognitive processing therapy and other forms of cognitive behavioral therapies for trauma is to help an individual um, develop pathways between uh, memories that can be distorted due to exposure to violence. And, and by distorted, I mean, we know that PTSD in some ways is a disorder of memory. And some of the things that happen is that people are unable to kind of make the connection between what had happened and, um, and some of the emotional aspects of things. So things can get a little like jumbled up and people can become emotionally dysregulated and they may also have some amnesia around events that may have happened. Um, part of that is we know that PTSD, a symptom of that is avoidance. And so it's a very normal part of the course of therapy. And so a lot of the initial part of the therapy is, is done with regard to education and helping people understand what are some of the, um, the ways that we um, understand um, trauma, how it impacts individuals, how it impacts communities. And then the part of the work of the therapy is to actually build bridges between these different memories and to help people be able to process through them in a safe environment in ways where they have already built uh, through the therapeutic process skills to help them develop ways to tolerate emotional distress and the idea being that over time, that there is an extinction process with regard to symptomatic development. So people over time become less symptomatic and less um, easily kind of um, activated around their trauma and, and triggers of that trauma. Uh, next slide, please. So that's just a little. <laughs> um, so basically this is kind of the heart of it and I, I'm, apologize that I'm kind of giving the very brief version, but um, we have piloted this within communities. We've had this vetted within communities. Communities have wanted to do this intervention as an example because of the storytelling nature and how that matches with communities. And so the three things that it really sort of helps to do in a very effective way is to approach fear eliciting stimuli or memories, uh, prevent avoidant behaviors and avoidant behaviors as we know clinically can be very complex. There can be a lot of constellation of different symptoms that are involved within that. Uh, and I won't go into all of those now, but, but helping um, people be aware of what those are and how to help um, intervene when they're having experiences um, around those behaviors. Um, anxiety you know, increases initially. However, what you do see is a longer term reduction in that anxiety process. And so it's been piloted, it's been adapted for tribal communities and implementation is ongoing. And I won't go into too much of the results since it's an ongoing trial, but wanted to give you some ideas of some of the things that we think about with regard to this particular therapy. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just an example of session one. You basically lay the lifeline. There's a photo up on the top of your screen that shows you literally get a string and you lay it out with the client. And part of the training to become, um, you know, trained into providing this therapy is you actually do this process yourself. And you take that string and you lay it out with the client and you place 
with them their autobiographical memories of, of their birth, starting with their birth in linear ways, moving through their life course. And so the stones represent the traumas that they've had experienced. So the goal again is this exposure and response prevention, building a description of the events on that lifeline within their life. Uh, and the aim is to try to connect, you know, with, of course, the client <laughs> at the lead, um, the hot, you know, kind of the kind of emotional sensory kind of aspects of, of, of a trauma memory with the cold memories of the trauma, the who, the what, the when, the why, the where, um, and weaving those two parts of the memory together so that people can bring together, you know, their cognitive framework, what they're thinking, what their kind of like cognitive processes around a memory with their heart, how they feel emotionally, how their body is reacting, both then at the time with the memory of the traumatic event with now. So it's a very clinically kind of based um, approach to, to trauma treatment. Next slide, please. So the next chapter, and this is a very short talk, so I apologize. I'm not getting into like a, a great, great deal of depth about these things, but when I have been doing this work, I've been doing this work since 2001 or so, um, I've been working to help to support advocacy along with the science that we're doing in the clinical trial work and, and many other factors. We have done a lot of um, survey research and all these different things to help um, advance our knowledge of, of, of trauma within American Indian communities. But I also um, have really invested in applied advocacy efforts and public health for survivors. I feel personally that that is a very much intertwined, important aspect of how we confront disentangling our lives as Indigenous people from trauma that has been oftentimes inflicted to us, you know, in terms of historical trauma, um, the genocide that we have experienced and the ongoing, um, you know, discrimination that is oftentimes built within systems, be they educational or um, economic. So as we think about working to advance creative ways, we have to think about ways to confront trauma in terms of our narrative. And that means looking at our community engagement strategies, thinking about community healing. And one of the things I was struck by in, uh, I recently reread um, uh, the uh, uh, an important book by Judith Herman about, uh, about trauma and recovery was that in her kind of follow-up um, text about that, she talked about the need for community healing and community trauma exposure. And one of the things that we know is that there is such depth to be learned from communities that have experienced an accumulation of historical trauma and how we think about how do we discuss marginalized communities? How do we empower survivors? And some of the things that we have been working on is we do digital storytelling workshops with American Indian communities to have community members tell their stories. So we often hear about suicide being a big problem within our communities. It is, in fact, American Indians have the highest rate of suicide. And in part that's driven by not only the social determinant factors, but some of the, the issues regarding trauma exposure. And, and we know from the adverse childhood experiences scores that we see within American Indian communities that, that we are facing some pretty, um, pretty difficult challenges within those regards. So, so for me as a scholar, some of the things that I've started to invest in have been ways to engage communities in empowering work around survivorship. So part of that has been in writings that I do. I mentioned the Indian Country Today article, uh, really looking at how we as communities, not only as Native people, but in general, have avoided topics that make us uncomfortable. And one of the topics has been how we have, have as a community, as a culture nationally, um, treated and marginalized Indigenous voices and lives. And so some of the things that I've been working to do is to develop things like podcasting. Um, I have a podcast that's called Native Women Rising, and we are working on season two right now. <laughs> and things I didn't think I would be doing as a clinical psychologist, but they are directly involved in survivorship and how we think about advocating for that. Another thing is I've recently become a, 
um, a film producer, which is kind of interesting, but it's because it's based on the narrative aspect of, of talking about survivorship and how do we think about mur missing and murdered indigenous women and how do we think about preventing those factors. So we have a film that's coming out called Dogwood, and it's basically a story of Indigenous women who are who are battling domestic violence and how do they think about um, how to intervene as a community and as a family. So asking difficult questions and and having kind of some some thought to that. And um, in that in that example. I'll mention my daughter is um, is the producer, the filmmaker of that film. It was shot at the Blackfeet um, Reservation, and we're very proud that we had an all you know Indigenous cast. You know, we had you know folks from the community who helped in many ways along the way. And then we also have a documentary that we're working on in public health called "Going to the Sun," and it's a documentary about the sister of my my uh, story of my sister. Pardon me, who. Um, had been murdered and looking at the impact of that trauma within one family and, and really kind of looking at kind of challenging, you know, our, our, you know, narrative around missing and murdered indigenous women to be inclusive of survivors and survivor stories. Next slide, please. So really it's an action oriented um, agenda in, in public health. We're, we're looking to share responsibility to actively translate science into communities that haven't always been heard or listened to or advocated for or with. Um, so advocacy worlds is something that I'm really passionate about is thinking about how do we create more survivor narratives, not only within our science, but also within our practices. And how do we have inclusive media that is a way that can really reach more people than we think in terms of, um, you know, it's, it's something that's accessible and that people will watch. So film and literature being examples of that and how do we think about you know, digitizing this as, as we've all faced this pandemic, we've had to become more creative. So podcasts and digital storytelling have been some of those factors. Um, our goal has been to empower survivors to be heard, seen, and encouraged to heal as individuals and communities. Next slide. So this is just to kind of end, you know, just a little information about um, our film. And our film, um, Dogwood, um, which is, um, it's, it's a healing plant for many tribal communities. And so um, Sipikinim is, is the Blackfeet word, which I may not be pronouncing right, but, but the story is really, you know, for all of us in public health and health, what would we do to help protect the ones we love? And for native scholars, it's a very personal question. How do we marginalize, the, how do community, sorry, communities that have been marginalized advocate for justice and health equity? So these are just some images that, that um, are from our experience and, and it's very much empowerment based and, and thinking about strengths. So I hope Dr. Glass is here. If not, I will wrap up quickly. If you're curious, the background to my slides is from an, a native auth, um, artist called John Pepian, who has done um, ledger artwork. He's Blackfeet and he has, he, we commissioned him to do this piece years ago and that's called uh, the uh, survivors. And so you can see that it's representative of native women who have experienced um, survivorship in a number of different domains um, based on some of the um, the, the clothing and the aspects of the artwork that's that's being used here. So there's a lot of creative ways that we can help to advance survivors' voices and have them feel heard, and that can be an important part of their healing process as well. Okay. There, uh, there might be a next slide, but... <laughs> Yes. So, so just to wrap up the going to the sun, this is the case study I mentioned. It's our own story. It's our actual story of, of our sister who was murdered in 2001. And so, you know, the study kind of, if you will, of the loss and the love that we had experienced and how we, we face that loss as a family, but also with the hopes that it can help other communities, other native communities. So that film is, is working um, through the editing process and we are actually having um, a manuscript that's going to be um, developed as well that includes survivor stories um, within that as well. So those are some of the efforts that we are engaged in. 
Thank you, Dr. Belcourt. That was a very helpful um, and informative uh, presentation. We so appreciate it. Um, so while we are uh, waiting for Dr. Glass to, to rejoin us, um, we thought we maybe could start off with a few questions. Um, and so the first one is, um, as you mentioned earlier, or whatever, in the COVID um, pandemic, we've had to start to be more flexible in terms of intervention implementation, um, like dis digitizing our efforts. Um, and so as again, also, as you mentioned, um, that there's been um, the traditional use of storytelling in um, uh, Native communities to uh, help uh, survivors work through life problems, address critical issues, etc. Uh, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, any work that you are, you and your uh, colleagues are doing to um, digitize structures um, that enable uh, survivors to work with or connect with one another um, as they're uh, endeavoring to um, uh, resolve uh, uh, tr trauma histories and, and create safety plans to keep themselves um, uh, working towards wellness. Definitely. Um, so there, there are, you know, so many efforts with regard to helping um, to prioritize safety planning for American Indian communities and also to help to, you know, cross this digital divide that's like historically impacted uh, Native communities um, more so than other communities. And we've seen that um, through the pandemic, you know, um, as far as like you know, just accessing the internet and remote learning options. And, and we've had to be really very creative. And I, I think that there are um, incredible ways that our tribal communities have, have worked to promote healing and wellness across the community that have included historical trauma. So one example I bet personally benefited from was um, uh, Blackfeet Community College did um, language classes. And those language classes were fully conducted with like Blackfeet speakers with, um, uh, we had speakers from Canada who, who, who taught hundreds of families um, the Blackfeet language. And within that, he also taught the culture and he taught the stories that were shared historically because you're exactly right. You know, the history of healing through storytelling and storyship is one that is, is you know, you know, since our, development as a people, <laughs> our creation stories go back. Um, and, and we have a history in the Blackfeet called Nopi stories. And they're stories that are kind of hyperbolized stories to kind of help show what to do and what not to do in terms of life, living skills. And when you look into them, there's stories about healing and there's stories that are about um, how do we reclaim our um, identities as native people that in many cases have been taken from us forcibly through the, the process of not only direct warfare and genocide, but also the residential school and boarding school era where our children were taken from us forcibly and beaten for speaking our language. Like we weren't able to practice our own ceremonies until 1978. And um, that is within my lifetime. <laughs> and that is, um, you know, an example of how we're thinking about digitizing. We're moving into having Zoom language and culture classes. We're, we're moving into um, documenting and finding ways to save our stories. Um, one of, we had an R01 um, funded here through the um, NIEHS that was on wood stove use. And one of the things that I helped with was to help develop ways to um, think about engaging the community in storytelling and through digital storytelling. And we worked with tribal elders who shared their story of how fire was, was provided through their creation stories and how it was represented with an abalone shell. And the abalone shell is, you know, so this is an example of one. <laughs> um, and one of the things that, that we, we learned was that there were certain forms of wood that were used for different ceremonies and that the stories were represented in a way of um, strength and prayer and renewal. So all of these things are very much interrelated and interwoven for indigenous communities. And as we think about health, it's very important to, to recognize that. And that's inclusive of trauma and, and how we heal from trauma and how we think about um, our interventions and adapting them. But it's it's been um, 
it's been a, a <laughs> eventful couple of years and and but I've very much um, respect and appreciate people like Dr. Carla Bird who's been doing work to revitalize culture and language within our communities and and I know this ha happens within many indigenous communities and and it's been something that has been very hopeful um, as we think about you know as we continue forward with this pandemic um, but the ways that we are as communities rising up and helping each other is really something I think is very admirable. Thank you, Dr. Belcourt. Um, so I have another question for you. Um, so in, um, I, I can imagine that in, in your work that you often get the opportunity to work with or engage with um, providers that are uh, uh, in the Indian Health Service. So I wanted to talk, talk, get you to talk a bit about um, any work that you're doing to kind of um, advance the capacity of uh, the health service and also just medical um, uh, and clinical providers in general to provide culturally competitive, um, culturally competent, excuse me, um, um, uh, care to uh, Indigenous populations, especially around um, uh, trauma and intimate po partner violence to include like linking them uh, to the necessary local supports to support their uh, recovery process. Definitely. So one of the things that we do, so I'm in the College of Health here at the University of Montana, is that we have um, many different programs that are, um, you know, multifaceted. One of the things that we do is we actually train um, Native Americans into a, a few different medical fields or health professions. So um, that being psychology, we have a psychology program that's very robust, and we have um, uh, social work, we have pharmacy, we've graduated the most native pharmacists in our region by far. Um, and some of those things have been really critical in terms of advancing care throughout our region and having culturally informed providers um, who also include native people actually. And um, one of the things that we do within our curriculum is across the curriculum is try to work to infuse cultural knowledge base. And we have, um, for example, one of our, our um, faculty taught for years about ethnobotanical healing and how some of our plant medicines have been used historically to treat different, all sorts of different medical um, ailments. But, but part of that, um, that, that knowledge sharing, things like aspirin comes from the willow tree, things like the Pacific U um, was developed, um, tamoxifen. And those examples are some that, you know, are kind of far, far reaching. But when we think about, you know, trauma, there's also a lot of our ceremonial ways that are, are really aimed at restoring health and balance to communities and to individuals. And those include things like, um, our sweat lodge ceremonies, um, smudging ceremonies, and some things that um, you know can be really important for folks' as healing. I have a doctoral student um, named Deshane Barnett, who is also our county health officer for Missoula, <laughs> and he is doing his dissertation work on traditional medicine and substance abuse prevention and looking at those topics. And they're also looking at um, a colleague of his looking at domestic violence and how those things kind of intertwine with um, protective factors being cultural, um, you know, cultural um, beliefs, knowledge, attitudes, practices. And that's something that I've looked at within my research as well and developed um, a scale for environmental exposures with American Indian communities. And the scale is one that we um, looked at with a collaboration with Harvard, where we um, developed a, a scale that not only looked at sort of what you would think about as natural disasters or environmental kind of stressors, but also social factors. So exposure to violence, um, exposure to drugs within the community, those sorts of things that we know are, you know, causally linked to some of the violence, um, you know, disparities that we see. And, you know, one of the things that we are starting to look at is how culture may be protective within the relationship between exposure to stressors and our health and mental and physical health. And so, so those are things that are really important analytical questions as well as we move forward with the science. Hi, I'm Nancy Glass. I am a professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing, and I'm going to present on some work we have been doing over the last um, 10 years, um, focusing on uh, developing and testing a mobile application for survivors of partner violence. 
um, really focused on uh, safety planning and then how to use safety planning to take action to improve their safety with the ultimate goal of reducing violence um, against women. So just some context before we start and why this is important, especially in the health um, care um, and health provider um, area. We know in the US, one in three women and one in seven men will experience abuse from a partner or ex-partner in their lifetime. And certainly the impact um, is felt by other members of the family. And specifically, we've done a lot of work on um, children and the impact on children and their, their exposure to witnessing violence, but also their exposure to, um, uh, they have an increased risk, risk of experiencing violence or, or um, corporal punishment, um, uh, severe discipline. And so also in the US, more than three women a day are murdered by their partner or ex-partner. And it's one of the key reasons I got into safety planning is that many, um, many women, when leaving their partner or making that decision to change, um, you know, a, a move from their home or change their setting, um, oftentimes they want to tell the partner because this is someone they had loved or really cared about that they are leaving. And what we know is that's the most dangerous time and um, it can trigger um, severe violence and often um, in, in some cases, homicide um, or femicide, the murder of women um, by their intimate partner. And so we wanna help uh, women to think about as they're making the decision, whether to, to, to end a relationship or stay in a relationship, we want to help them think about how to safely safely um, communicate with a partner, ex-partner, to reduce the risk of severe and extreme violence and femicide. And some of the work we've been doing over the pandemic has really helped us to, um, to really understand the impact of the pandemic on, um, on violence and the gendered effects of, of COVID and how that impacts violence, um, especially in young relationships, adolescents um, and young adults. And this is just a, a graphic that our colleagues in Kenya did as we were talking about and doing work around um, increases in partner violence. And they really talked about that loss of income. And this is very similar to what we're seeing in the US. This financial stress, the inability to make the bills, the rent, all of those um, stresses social confinement, being in a place with a lot of stress without being able to go and see supportive family members or friends can be very stressful. Not being able to see your loved ones, go visit, you're worried about your other family members. And then how that impacts communication and relationships that are already um, stressed and, and uh, challenging, this could be something that really moves it to violence. And those in relationships where there's already been violence, it could escalate and, and the violence could become more severe. Um, and so we also know that um, the health consequences of partner violence are severe and diverse. And certainly, you know, people typically think of um, the black eye or the broken arm or um, other bruises that you would see the, the physical injuries. But what we hear a lot and most uh, long-term effects is the, the, the mental health impact of uh, the trauma, the PTSD, um, chronic pain, certainly. Um, and, and it is not uncommon um, for uh, women to use substances to help to cope with the trauma or the pain. And so that does increase risk for alcohol use, increases risk for um, cigarette smoking, um, and, 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 other, and other drugs. And so, but we also see impact on um, pregnancies. Um, it, we've seen a preterm delivery, uh, low birth weight. So it has a range of impact in health impacts. Um, and so as, as healthcare providers thinking about that when we're seeing patients, it's been really um, the focus of our work is trauma-informed care. And then how do we refer patients to um, uh, using safety planning and reaching out to community resources? So this is some work that the WHO has done is really healthcare workers can really help women and, and the, in this increased 
stressful time. And we really focus on that frontline support to women, the, the, even in the primary care clinic, the prenatal clinic, emergency departments, certainly, but also counseling programs, how to really think about medical treatment. And, but importantly, and, and what we've been working on is that connecting to survivors to ongoing support, because we know healthcare visits can be very short. There's a lot to cover. The health system is overburdened. And so these challenges, um, and even in telehealth, we can provide resources and especially a link to uh, an online tool can be really helpful. So that's why, just with that background, that's why we really focused on developing an accessible, free resource that can be personalized to the, to the, to the woman's situation. And I've been focused on women in this, in this, um, in this presentation so far, um, but we have adapted my plan now for all genders. Um, why I focused on re women primarily is certainly the, the context in which I'm presenting this is through, for colleagues at NIH and, and focused on women's health, but also um, most of our research um, has been focused on uh, young women, um, th women through the lifespan, and we're increasing more work on young women. We are starting to do the work certainly with young men and um, um, but what we know is that the, the violence has been most severe, the health consequences have been most severe for women. And um, globally, it's um, the women are most at risk for partner violence and the long-term health impact. So that's my focus here. But do know that my plan has been developed with the best evidence we have for all genders. Um, and we wanted to, to note that it is certainly a tool for survivors to connect for themselves. It's in the App Store, it's free, it's on Android, Google, it's Google Android, so you can just download it. But it's also something that we built for advocates and healthcare providers to use, um, not as, we don't want this to be a replacement for the amazing work that's being done in these systems, but as a resource um, given the, the burden on health systems that they can refer their um, patients to. If they have time, they can walk through the app with the patient, but that they can provide the link and that will help them then connect to local resources. So, you know, one of the key things that we've heard, we all know of the dangers of technology and how technology can be used to um, harass, stalk. Um, and so one of the key things is that people ask us, rightfully so, is, well, how, what if the abusive partner finds the app? Um, and so that's something that we take very seriously and have worked with survivors and worked with advocates um, over the years to think through um, safety. And so one of the things is my plan, the name was really chosen so that it wasn't identify as something around violence against women or children. Um, it could be, we, the women said, oh, it could be just scheduling appointments. It could be about my menstrual cycle. It could be all kinds of things so that it doesn't, tar it doesn't identify um, a focus on violence. Um, and we, we certainly have the user decide on their PIN code. It is PIN code secure, password protected. We also have um, embedded information about if a partner does force um, uh, the user to um, put in their PIN code to see what the app is, we have encouraged them to put in four zeros um, as a dummy PIN code if it's discovered. And that will take them to a, um, and it, depending on the setting, it will take them to a women's health page. In, um, in Kenya, it takes them to a recipe page. So different solutions depending on the setting. Um, and so we also have embedded throughout the app and from the beginning, because we want users to know it may not be the right resource for them at this time. It may be too dangerous. So really for them to think about downloading an app onto their phone, is it connected to their partner's phone? Is their account so it could be downloaded on their partner's account, um, device? So really thinking through. And so we've embedded a lot of tech safety information that has been developed by our partners at the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And they have reviewed this app multiple times to make sure we're really focusing on safety. So when someone logs in, we do an orientation and onboarding. And the first screen is really um, 
the user lands on the page that has a, a what we call the static safety plan. This is a safety plan that many of you have probably been aware of in your own clinical practice or training. It really focuses on, you know, have a pack your bag, have a safe place where you hide your a backpack with important documents, medication, you know, have a plan with your children, have a plan with a friend that you can stay there, a place that your partner doesn't know, for example. And so that's the static plan. And that is given to everyone. Everybody can have a safety plan. And then that will link you to, if you put in your zip code or county, we can link you to resources in your community. And we partnered with the National Domestic Violence National Domestic Violence Hotline to develop and use their database to do, do that. Um, so um, it, it just is, a, a, you know, if people don't have a lot of time to, to really personalize the safety plan, here's a safety plan that they can immediately use. But if they do have enough time to personalize my plan, we think this is really where the innovation is in this work, is that they can answer specific information based on research that we know can increase uh, risk of violence and strategies based on the evidence that could be used to reduce that violence. So we have se four sections that really we ask the user to complete. The more they complete, the more personalized their plan becomes. So if they only have time to complete my relationship health, then it will be more personalized than the static plan, but it won't be as complete as it could be. So we do encourage them to come back if they have time to further um, uh, complete activities in the assess section. Um, and so things we ask for, for example, in the relationship health is we ask about red flags for an unhealthy or abusive relationship. This has really come up from working with, um, with survivors for years is that, it's hard to acknowledge what your experience is, is abuse and violence by someone you love. So really thinking through and, and answering these questions about, does your partner, for example, make you feel guilty for doing things that you'd like to do? You know, are they controlling? So we're asking specific questions that have been used in multiple strat and multiple programs to help really think about what is healthy and what is unhealthy. We're not necessarily saying that this is a violent relationship, but we also want people to think about what is healthy and what is unhealthy. So we give them specific feedback after they answer these questions um, around it, that their relationship has signs of being unhealthy and even unsafe. And so that's when we say, view your safety plan that is updated with nine new strategies. So based on their answers, like, is your partner jealous of you? Do they, um, does your partner, um, uh, you know, um, threaten you? Um, it, do you believe your partner's capable of hurting you? Those are the things that we really want to know to help them, encourage them to look, go into the safety plan. Um, we also are using, and this is for um, what we consider a really key part at work that has been done by my colleague at Hopkins, Jackie Campbell, for years really trying to develop and validate, um, not trying, but developing and validating a um, measure called the danger assessment, which is now 20 items. And 19 of those items are asking about the abuse of partner's behavior. If a user says my partner is female, then the danger assessment has been adapted for women who are in abusive um, same-sex relationships. If they say their partner is trans or, um, um, you know, uh, or another gender identity, we have worked on the pronouns and we've worked on the language to make it inclusive. Um, although we're, we're developing um, more validation of the tool being used with a, um, um, multiple gender identities. We haven't done that validation work. That is in process, um, but we think it's really important. We've done um, some focus groups and uh, in-depth interviews with trans women in Baltimore to help us develop the language and the terminology and the resources. So that is an ongoing process. But um, what this helps is they answer 19 questions about their abusive partner's behavior. One question is about their own risk of um, suicide. 
because that's a red flag for us to send them directly, immediately information for the National Suicide Hotline, ask them if they would, if they want to connect with a resource and make sure in their community that they can connect um, by putting in their zip code or um, county. Um, and so this gives an ex immediately, once they complete the 20 questions, it gives them a score based on the, it's a weighted scale that's been validated from extreme, extreme danger, severe, increased variable. We, we use variable because we don't wanna ever say in an abusive rela relationship that um, even though there's not multiple risk factors that, that um, it couldn't turn very dangerous quickly. Um, and then unknown is if they're just not responding. We just want to say, we can't give you feedback and personalize this without responses. Um, and then um, we, we developed this with a colleague at the, uh, several years ago, um, looking at decision aids and you know the competing um, decisions that the evidence has told us that many um, survivors are trying to make in um, developing a safety plan, especially if they have children. Children are oftentimes weighing on the survivor about what action to take. The partner may be a very good father or parent. They may, may be the person who is providing income to the family, et cetera. So they're trying to weigh these, um, these priorities in making their decisions for safety. So we wanted to give them an opportunity. And so we develop an algorithm based on decision science and, and have them compare what we've seen is the priorities that we've seen over and over are feelings for their partner. They love their partner. They would like to stay with their partner, but they need the violence to end. Um, their children, if they have children, if they don't have children, this priority would not be presented. Their own health and well-being, um, having resources, and that includes income, um, um, their partner's income, insurance, et cetera. And then the last one is, um, uh, the, last, the last one is, thinking about that, <laughs> oh, privacy. Many, uh, many survivors are um, concerned about confidentiality and who's gonna have this information. And so thinking about strategies, if priority is their, um, their, if privacy is their priority, letting them know that there are confidential hotlines, that counselors will not share their information, their partner won't find out, their workplace won't find out. Those are the things that people bring up. So we wanna make sure that we have strategies that support privacy. And then once that information has been entered, so they've, they've entered information about their relationship, healthy or unhealthy, They've entered information using the danger assessment. And those questions, for example, could be, is there a gun in the home? That's gonna really help inform us around safety strategies. Um, does he use alcohol? That's gonna help us send resources that include um, you know, programs to support him getting treatment, right? And, um, and so those are some of the questions on the danger assessment. Um, and then the last one are the decision aid, where that helps us determine what their priorities are. We don't want to focus on safety strategies that on children if they don't have children, um, or if, on privacy if privacy is not a priority. So we give them immediate feedback on what their priorities, how they've ranked their priorities. They can go back and change those priorities because they certainly will change over time. And based on that input, we then provide the safety plan that is updated with personal strategies and resources based on their input. So then they can click on any, so for example, make an emergency plan, they could click on that and give three strategies that they might wanna try and then links to resources um, in their community. Um, and you know, legal help, for example, if they're concerned about their children's safety, perhaps that she has left the relationship, but her partner has custody, uh, shared custody, and she's concerned, gives information about um, legal resources in the area from pro bono to paid, certainly. And then um, we, we have really focused on taking care of the health. So we have links to um, free apps around um, meditation, um, linking to wellness um, strategies and, and information. Um, and then 
Also, we want them to feel like they can directly contact the national hotline or their state hotline or do a live chat um, that's been built in be too, because a lot of people don't wanna make that call, but they are okay with chatting with an advocate. Um, and then we included a section that we call learn because survivors are um, uh, really interested in, um, you know, they're learning about what is a violent relationship or, or a friend of a, a survivor is using this and they want to learn or a family member. And so um, we have some, some information about myths or facts. Um, and so they can answer a quiz, um, it, which gives them immediate feedback. And then also some information about what is a healthy relationship. Also, we've built in how long it takes to go to, to, through this content. We, we've found that people are like worried once they start, it could take forever. So we want them to know, you know, depending on what you use, this is how long it could take. Um, and so um, we've done, a, now um, we are in our, we've had two trials in the US using my plan and we're now in our third trial that has been adapted for, one has been for community-based, um, women living throughout the US. We worked with um, over 700 women to originally test my plan. And we uh, followed them over time for a year, in fact, to look at changes in safety um, and ultimately um, re reductions in violence. We've then done a similar study on college campuses um, throughout, the U throughout two, two states. Um, Maryland and Oregon with 40 campuses looking with 600 survivors. What we added into the college was we've also talked with friends, people that identified as um, friends of um, people that were, they felt that they were in an unsafe relationship. And um, that was really important because the evidence has shown that especially young people, um, they go to a friend before they go to anybody else. Oh, and the friends are what, who often are noticing behavior that they are concerned about, but they just don't know how to talk about it. So we have a, also a section in my plan for friends and, and family members that they can learn more about unhealthy relationships and they can think through how to talk about that with their friend. So what we've, and then the third one, we're in a trial now, we've adapted it for 15 to 17 year olds. And it's been adapted to really focus on what is a healthy and unhealthy relationship, as well as what is consent um, and, um, and then uh, really empowering work, the young people. And so this is both for male and, male and female, 15, 17 year old, as well as um, gender diverse, um, um, diverse gender identities. And so, it, and that is national as well. And so we have enrolled uh, we have enrolled 600 uh, young people and we're following them over time as well. So what we've found um, is that um, that using my plan compared to what we consider usual safety planning, really that static safety plan, the not personalized, we see that it reduces decisional conflict. You know, do you have enough information to make the decisions around safety? Do you, are you clear on your priorities? Um, and do you know where to seek information? So we've seen that it's reduced that decisional conflict. We've also seen that it increases use of safety strategies, but also that they're ranked more helpful. And we think certainly that's related to the, the, um, the tailoring the safety strategies to the specific situation. Um, if somebody tells us something's not helpful, we don't wanna keep encourage them to seek that, that resource. It also has one of the questions that I had always wondered, we had always talked about safety planning, reducing um, uh, violence for, for those survivors who have decided to leave or end an abusive relationship. What we found is over time, those, those women who, um, and, and this was a women only study, those women who used um, uh, my plan were more likely to report that they ended the relationship safely than usual safety planning. And then we've also seen in our college sample that it has reduced reproductive coercion and the risk of suicide for young women, 18 to 24. And if you've been following the media, suicide is, is really an increasing risk to young 
young, young people in general. And in this sample, um, we studied, we focused on young women um, and, and college campuses. So those were some important studies. I want to note that in all of these studies, about 40% of our participants have self-identified as um, uh, uh, women of color. And so, um, and we also have had pretty good response from women who identify their partners female. Um, again, fewer um, and with um, participants who have identified um, um, uh, as transgender or gender diverse. But in our teen study, we have seen, uh, we've been able to expand our recruiting strategies and we're gonna be able to talk more about um, gender diverse, um, gender diverse gender identities in our, in our um, new trial, which we're very excited about. I do wanna say that we've adapted um, now my plan to a low middle income country and that's Kenya. Um, we conducted a trial there and we're conducting a second trial looking at how do you disseminate um, through um, more formal services um, like health systems, um, advocacy programs, but also through informal sectors of social media um, targeting um, diverse populations throughout the country. Um, the other countries that we trialed, this, we've conducted research are Australia, Canada and New Zealand. We've, all, we've done um, randomized trials in all of those settings. And what we found um, consistently is that um, it doesn't necessarily reduce all forms of violence. We see that there is a reduction over time in um, physical and sexual violence, um, but that reduction is not um, significantly different than um, women who use the control safety planning. But what we've seen is that um, it, it can reduce the decisional conflict. Women find the services more helpful and that those that have ended the relationship um, can uh, report that um, they are safer. So what we want to focus on with my plan is we don't think one use of a safety plan is going to end violence, but we think it is a moves women and other users to understanding what their priorities are, what are the resources available. And ending violence may take longer than the year follow up. I mean, leaving a relationship with the violence ending, but that we're progressing towards that. And key that they know that there are resources available to them in their community. Um, and this is just the last slide is just some work. This is my plan teen is in the works. It's very, uh, it's much more um, integrated, more videos. We've developed a whole new um, look and feel to it. Um, and so based on the work we've done with teens and learning a lot about um, co-design and user experiences, um, a version four of my plan will be out in the next month for all users. So it'll be a much updated based on now multiple studies that we can really feel that confident that um, it does, we have not had reports that it does harm or that users are unsafe by using the technology to reach out. Um, so that's been a key finding um, for us too over these studies that we haven't done harm and we haven't increased um, risk to users for um, more violence. So um, thank you very much. And um, I'm glad to discuss. Thank you so much, Dr. Glass. This is really important work um, and really just great hearing about your efforts here. Um, and so I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about your efforts. You mentioned to incorporate gender inclusive language throughout the app um, and that you've consulted with advocates and community organizations. Um, and so thinking about that in relation to um, racial and ethnic disparities among intimate partner violence in the US. Have you, um, can you say a little bit more about your process for ensuring that the app is culturally responsive as well? Yeah, um, that has been, you know, we're very lucky to work with a, a lot of survivors and advocates who, um, who have guided us and informed us about the right language and the resources that are considered uh, relevant and appropriate. 
So one, one thing we've done is it is in Spanish as well. That's been a key thing to have it um, accessible. Um, we, we certainly have worked um, with colleagues um, on uh, different languages. We, um, but what we've worked on now is one adaption for um, immigrant women um, that is in a, that's being tested now, funded by um, NICHD. Um, and my colleague at Hopkins is doing that evaluation. And so it, it is in multiple languages. Um, and um, so we're really looking at um, recruiting um, immigrants um, and, and to the US and their experience of violence. And one of the things we know is they often feel very isolated from resources, aren't aware of resources. So that's been a real key work. And the process for that too is focus groups, interviews, co-design process with potential users, the survivors themselves, and then advocates that are working in that community to help us design and identify the right resources and the right language. Um, we've also, um, in, in working with, um, and that's our process throughout, is having those advocates work with us. Um, we also have partnered with community-based agencies. For example, with the teen program, we partnered with um, uh, urban uh, Baltimore City that are working with youth, young adults, um, and they, um, and then we work with rural youth in partnerships in Missouri to make sure we're having diverse voices in the development of these tools. Um, we hired a, um, to work with us, a design firm that had expertise in user experiences and the language. And that really helped us in learning the process of co-design, what that really means. Um, and, um, and so making, assuring that we're also targeting recruitment um, and um, information to communities that are serving, um, especially uh, African-American women, um, American Indian, Native American women. We have an adaption now in process with Native American women, um, Asian women, we have an adaption. So, and then immigrants. So we've been working to make it as adaptable. We've also um, recognizing, you know, feedback from users, like this is not trans friendly. This language is not okay. Um, and so they, we have consulted with um, and hired um, community members to help us work on the language, help us work on the, um, the, um, the resources. And then we did interviews because one thing we learned in working with uh, especially trans women um, is the community violence they experience as well, or the violence they experience in going to seek care at a doctor's office or getting on the bus. Um, and so we, we really feel like we need to put more in around safety and community violence as well and, and resources there um, because the police for many of them don't feel like a safe place to seek care. In fact, they could be part of their, um, uh, the abusive experience in the community. So that really came out in connection with partner violence. So adding in content specific to the needs of the community is the other thing that we've been working on. Um, we, there's limitations. I mean, I know this, is, but you know, this is one app. And so we're trying to balance um, you know, that people will be able to get through the material, it'll be useful to them. So that's why we're really personalizing it. And we ask some questions up front. How do you identify? Um, how does your partner identify? So that we make sure that the strategies that are being provided um, are uh, appropriate using the right pronouns. And so those are some things we do build into the algorithm so that we can really personalize. And people wonder why we ask those questions up front. It really is to tailor um, the the strategies and the and the language and the and the tool. I, along with my ORWH colleagues, would like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters, Dr. Nancy Glant, 
Glass and Annie Belcourt, the attendees of today's U3 webinar and the larger community of researchers, advocates, and stakeholders for your contribution and commitment to health equity and to the advancement of study designs that intentionally considers women's health. Also, we want to express appreciation for the interagency communication teams for their work on the event promotion. In the post-event email, you will receive a link to the webinar recording as well as the scheduled 2022 sessions of the Diverse Voices, Intersectionality, and the Health of Women virtual lecture series. Please feel free to share this information with your network, and we look forward to your attendance and participation. For additional information on ORWH efforts to promote equity-oriented research and advanced science for the health of women, please go to the website orwh.od.nih.gov. Thank you again, and this concludes today's U3 session.